I'm gravely concerned about the information provided us just uh, yesterday that the President received a warning in August about the threat of hijackers uh, by Osama bin Laden and his organization. We shouldn't jump to any conclusions. Earlier this year, the Vice President Cheney called you and asked you not to hold wide-ranging wide hearings and to limit the investigation to the Intelligence Committee. Looking back, do you, why do you think he made that call? Do you think that he knew that the White House did know something and that they were trying to keep the investigation limited because they didn't want to look culpable at all? Well, I'm not going to come to any conclusions. It is true that the Vice President has requested on several occasions that we not have an investigation into this issue. How many times did the Vice President ask you not to investigate this, and have others at the White House also asked that there be no investigation? Oh, I'm not sure. It was it's, There were numerous times. I can't recall exactly how many. What were his reasons? His reasons were that uh, the intelligence community was so involved in the aftermath of 9-11 that they didn't want to take people off of what it was they were doing uh, to do something like this. He asked you more than once. Correct. And it, it was it more than twice? <laughs> <laughs> Bob, it was three and a half times. <laughs> Yeah. And it was no I don't, investigation I don't. whatsoever. He wasn't asking for it to keep it, to keep it uh, closed, to keep it to intelligence. He wanted no investigation. That's correct. What kind of government doesn't want an investigation into the biggest attack on its homeland since World War II? Breaking news we're getting from the PA Newswire that there's been the reports of an explosion outside Liverpool Street Station. That, of course, in the east end of London. It's the, the uh, bordering area. And what kind of treasonous little asshole would try that in our country? At the moment, we have a clear act of threat. I want our police and our security services focused on dealing with that threat. If they end up being engaged in a public inquiry, the reality is no matter what people might want or say they want at the outset, is that the resource and commitment and energy of those services will be diverted into that in circumstances where we know what has happened. Now, I totally understand, particularly when families are reading constant reports in the media about pieces of information that the security services had that they didn't act on. John Hill, John Hill, BBC Conspiracy Files. Can I ask you why you've made a film accusing innocent people of mass murder on 7-7 with no evidence at all? You have made a film which is damaging trust in the British government. Is that your intention, Mr Hill? Since we caught up with him, John Hill has been arrested. He is facing extradition to the UK on a charge of perverting the course of justice by sending DVDs of 7-7 ripple effect to the judge and jury foreman in a trial linked to 7-7. The BBC decided not to make a programme about John Hill's court case. Having seen his film 7-7 Ripple Effect, a British jury found him not guilty of perverting the course of justice. And for a documentary that points out the gaping holes in the official narrative of the London bombings, that's quite an achievement for a movie allegedly containing no evidence at all. We suggest you watch 7-7 Ripple Effect it's free on the internet, unlike the propaganda your license fee is funding. Meanwhile, on Channel 4. At Westminster Hospital, policemen waited anxiously to hear news of their colleague, but early this afternoon, a statement was made about her. She was brought to the hospital just before 11 o'clock today. She was taken to theatre, and after about an hour undergoing surgery, she died at about midday. A senior figure in the Reagan administration told me privately that the death of Yvonne Fletcher was the best thing that could have happened. What do you think he meant by that?
political dimension was that it changed the attitude of the British government toward Qaddafi. And it affected many Europeans as well. His report raises the most profound concerns about the intelligence services in Britain and America. It's an extraordinary suggestion that you are making. I want you to be quite clear. You do not believe Yvonne Fletcher was shot from that embassy building behind you. For two reasons. The terminal velocity of 30 yards, which is the distance from me to the building, uh, is, would be an extraordinary event for a submachine gun bullet. And secondly, the angle of 60 to 70 degrees of entry into the body would be totally inconsistent with an angle of 15 degrees or so coming from that building. There may well have been shots fired from number five, but you can't say that the bullet that entered her body came from that angle. It's impossible to have that occur. Lieutenant Colonel George Stiles, 26 years in the British Army, was one of its leading weapons experts. I don't think a submachine gun killed the police lady. Why not? Because the, the bullet was going comparatively slowly, and I think from a submachine gun it would have gone that extra bit faster than, than the wounds that you've described. Sterling is a submachine gun, and at 30 yards you'd expect the bullet to go almost straight through anybody standing in front of it. From the description of the wounds, uh, I think if it was a submachine gun, uh, there would have been a, a little bit more... Uh, penetration. The bullet wouldn't have tumbled about so much, it would have gone a bit straighter. The end of the range of a submachine gun certainly isn't 30 yards. On dispatches this week and next, back on the trail of one of the most important investigations the programme has mounted. Dramatic new evidence on the killing of policewoman Yvonne Fletcher in London St James's Square. Tonight, how the official version of the events behind her murder cannot be true. How she cannot have been shot from the Libyan embassy, but if not, then how? In a major two-part investigation, dispatches reporter Joe Laban pieces together the full sinister truth behind her death. He will meet the man who knows just why she was killed, and the man who brought the gun into this country. And he will ask exactly who was in the know. A senior figure in the Reagan administration told me privately that the death of Yvonne Fletcher was the best thing that could have happened. What do you think he meant by that? Where do your loyalties lie? because it's quite clear where theirs do. Let us never tolerate outrageous conspiracy theories concerning the attacks of September the 11th. Malicious lies that attempt to shift the blame away from the terrorists themselves, away from the guilty. Secretary, according to the Comptroller General of the United States, there are serious financial pro management problems at the Pentagon. Fiscal year 1999, 2.3 trillion missing. Fiscal year 2000, 1.1 trillion missing. And DOD is the number one reason why the government can't balance its checkbook. The Pentagon has claimed year after year that the reason it can't account for the money is because its computers don't communicate with each other. Finally, Mr. Secretary, after the last hearing, I thought that my office was promised a written response to my question regarding the four war games on September 11th. I have not yet received that re response, but would like for you to respond to the questions that I've put to you today, and then I do expect the written response to my previous question, hopefully by the end of the week. Mr. Bush was very quick to make it clear about so-called conspiracy theories on 9-11 alarmingly quick.
Non-believers are a particular problem. They're very keen to have disappear, even to have outlawed. And making problems disappear is something they're rather good at in America. So too their media, especially when it comes to false flags and political obstacles. Good evening, Dr. Martin Luther King, the apostle of nonviolence in the civil rights movement, has been shot to death in Memphis, Tennessee. Police have issued an all points bulletin for a well-dressed young white man seen running from the scene. Officers also reportedly chased and fired on a radio equipped car containing two white men. Dr. King was standing on the balcony of a second floor hotel room tonight when, according to a companion, a shot was fired from across the street. In the friend's words, the bullet exploded in his face. Police, who have been keeping a close watch over the Nobel Peace Prize winner because of Memphis' turbulent racial situation, were on the scene almost immediately. They rushed the 39-year-old Negro leader to a hospital where he died of a bullet wound in the neck. In 1999, the widow of uh, Dr. King wants to try the, the maimed conspirator Lloyd Jowers as a conspirator in the assassination of Dr. King. Uh, William Pepper is the King family attorney. And a jury found that the United States government, along with Lloyd Jowers, conspired to murder Dr. King. It's what we already knew, but that trial um, was not covered by the press. There was only one journalist in the room. And um, if you can imagine, only one journalist in the room for something so important as the trial to establish who conspired to kill Dr. King. But that also tells us the state of our media. It was at that trial that Dr. King was specifically targeted by name in um, the counterintelligence program. He was harassed, he was vilified, he was persecuted in every way imaginable. And all he wanted was the right, of, right to vote for black people, that's all, I mean, you know. Um, now they figured out other ways to subvert the vote, but um, they should have known that they were going to be able to do that. So let them vote and stop the, you know, the turmoil that the country was going through. But no, and the church committee reports reveal that this behavior, the counterintelligence program behavior was carried out for political purposes, for certain individuals who had political objectives. What that means is that individuals who were insiders had access to the tentacles of government and could manipulate those tentacles for their own benefit. This is a very important finding of the church committee reports. December 1999, Judge Joe Brown came to one of my many COINTELPRO hearings that I had when I was in Congress. And I had one on the murder of Dr. King. And there I had Judge Brown studying the ballistics of that so-called murder weapon and found that it was not the, the weapon that actually killed Dr. King. Now, that's very interesting because that rifle is at the Lorraine Motel in Tennessee, purportedly the murder weapon, but it's not the murder weapon. Everything that you think you know about the murder of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is a lie. One journalist in the room.
So, Robbie Cheney changes his story. Let me just briefly explain why. Um, in this documentary in Showtime, he says that there was a shootdown order, that he actually said he was going to shoot down the plane to save lives, mm -hmm. which actually contradicts the 9-11 Commission report that says that there was um, no order made. Mm -hmm. Why do you think he changed his story here? Well, because I think that he probably thought that people didn't remember that he had presidential emergency powers on that day. and. I mean, the testimony shows that Cheney, you know, was at least criminally culpable for not issuing an evacuation order. During the time that the airplane coming in to the Pentagon, uh, there was a young man who would come in and say to the vice president, the, the plane is 50 miles out, the plane is 30 miles out. And when it got down to the plane is 10 miles out, uh, the young man also said to the vice president, do the orders still stand? And uh, the vice president turned and whipped his neck around and said, of course the orders still stand. Have you heard anything to the contrary? Planes 10 miles out, 20 miles out, 30 miles out, does the order still stand? Cheney's saying, of course they still stand. Mm. Obviously he's talking about a plane coming close. Why do you think there wasn't an evacuation order issued from the Pentagon? On the off chance your place of work is ever targeted by a 150-foot-long Boeing jetliner one morning and your boss knows that it's coming, you might feel a slight grievance and concern when he fails to evacuate the building, especially when nearly 200 of your colleagues are killed. April Gallup and her baby boy suffered serious injury at her Pentagon office when it was struck just yards from her desk. Foolishly, she believed she had a right to question this and other failures in a court of law and to get a fair hearing. But like most questions that surround 9-11, not only do they get fudged nor make the front pages, they get very special treatment from a judge. The least thing we can rationally say is, you were on duty that day, this was your job, this happened on your watch. We don't know, based off evidence, whether you were intentional, deliberate, or you were indirectly involved just on the basis of this was your duty. For example, like a CEO. No, you're not responsible for the person who, the accountant who might run off with all the money, but you're the CEO. You should know the people that you hire. You should know you know, the type of people that you hired. So we thought that that was a fair rational prem premises to bring to court because you failed. I first realized about it through my attorney. Um, he was going over the likelihood of, uh, we would have a higher likelihood of being challenged than we would of it going through proper um, no, I wouldn't say proper, but going through in a more smooth manner, like it's due process, that he felt like we would have more challenges. So I was wondering, okay, I expect that. What would that be? And that's when he let me know about um, Mr. Bush, um, relative, being one of the judges. So I didn't know how close he was. I just was told that he was a cousin. I don't know if he was first, second, third. I, I didn't know his numerical, but the issue was, even me, not knowing, you know, the legal world, that I just felt like that's conflict of interest. My first thing was, okay, I'm sure you know legally what you could do to try to handle that or to um, deal with that, whether it's file a complaint, which I wouldn't know what he would do, but said, so whatever you need to do, try to, you know, try to work through that because, wow, that is going to be a problem. Well, he got sanctioned and they considered the case as frivolous and it was thrown out. And so that was a big disappointment because we never really got to really present the bulk of the information and the evidence. And so with the frivolous claim, that meant, and not on top of that, we're going to sanction this fine. We're going to give you a fine and make sure <laughs> you don't do this again. Judge John Walker leads a charmed life. Not only can he get appointed to preside over highly sensitive court cases concerning his own family, 
he can run down and kill a traffic cop with apparent immunity from police procedure. If you've never wondered why all the same stories are on all the same channels, maybe it's time you did. Because despite all these media organizations being supposedly independent, they're obviously not. Either that or it's one hell of a coincidence. And isn't it clear what kind of message they want us to get? One British man decided he didn't believe it anymore. So he went to court to obey the law. Most of us think we know the story of 9-11, that planes hit the Twin Towers and that they collapsed, taking World Trade Center 7, a nearby skyscraper, with them. But a group of people known as truthers think that's not the whole story. Now their evidence isn't often heard, but on Monday, February 25th, a court case in Horsham, a small town in West Sussex, was set to give a voice to people who believe that we haven't heard the true story of 9-11. One such man is Tony Rook, and on February 25th he had a rare opportunity to showcase his evidence in a tiny regional magistrate's court in the town of Horsham in Sussex. Tony was on trial for failing to pay his TV licence, which is used to fund the BBC. Tony claimed that to pay the fee meant funding terrorism, because the BBC is implicit in a cover-up which had sparked the so-called War on Terror. I'd written to the BBC in 2005, 2006 and asked them if they could give me the, you know, the original uh, source for the story about World Trade Center 7 having gone down, which they reported numerous times um, before it occurred. Uh, they asked me to file a Freedom of Information Act request, which I did, um, and that came back saying that they couldn't tell me. So that was a lot of use. And to this day, the BBC have never revealed or not bothered to investigate um, the original source for the story of World Trade Center 7 going down. They've turned around since and said, oh, it was Reuters, news agency that gave us the information. But that's like saying, where does sugar come from? It comes from Tesco's. Well, no, it doesn't come from Tesco's. It you know, comes from sugar beets. It's not the original source. And so I felt until they could give me that information, I wasn't going to pay them. What happened was when we went to court, I had to assemble this team of people uh, to cover the various aspects of the BBC's coverage of 9-11. And when you look at it, um, to say it's deceitful would be polite. Among the witnesses due to be called was Tony Farrell, a former senior intelligence analyst from South Yorkshire Police, who claims he was fired for publicising his views on 9-11. I went to my organisation with a plea saying, all the evidence stacks one way and it points towards internal tyranny. Can you show me proofs that the threats from Islamic terrorism? Because without the proofs, I'm not prepared to lie for you. Now, they didn't say I was wrong, Tony. They didn't offer any proofs. They simply said, Tony, we are just the government foot soldiers. You and I um, will never get them ever to tell the truth. Uh, but if you don't go along with it, basically, we'll have no option but to withdraw your privilege from the organisation and actually your views are incompatible with being a principal intelligence analyst. They offered me resignation, they offered me to retire, they took me to the occupational health, but I said, no, you're going to have to sack me for this. The police force didn't comment on the exact circumstances of his dismissal, but confirmed that Mr Farrell's position had become untenable. Uh, but the biggest, uh, the most damning piece of evidence against the BBC and their deliberate cover-up is, is how they've dealt with the free fall of Building 7. So um, the, the BBC are uh, absolutely aware of what the implications are of free fall because back in 2007 they, they ran a documentary called The Truth uh, Behind the Third Tower uh, looking specifically at the free fall of Building 7 and they did their own analysis to attempt to show that free fall didn't occur. Um, so they know full well what the implications are of free fall. Uh, the problem was that one year later, NIST, the official investigators, uh, were forced to finally ad admit that free fall had actually occurred in Building 7. Now that should have been absolutely bombshell uh, news across the world. The BBC should have been on the front page of the paper. NIST had confirmed free fall of Building 7, which is proof of controlled demolition, which is proof of an inside job. Massive story. Uh, the BBC are legally required then, legally and morally required, 
to correct the error that they made in their own documentary one year earlier, uh, denying that free fall happened. Uh, did they correct that error? Still to this day, the BBC have refused to correct that error on an issue of absolute massive importance. The implications of Building 7 coming down in free fall are huge for every fire service in the world. The reason for that is because when you fight a high rise building fire, what you do is you go to the floor below the fire, you establish a bridgehead, you then send breathing apparatus teams up the stairs onto the next floor where the fire actually is together with water jets to go and find the fire, locate it, attack it um, and put it out. You do not at any time think that the building you're actually stood in is suddenly going to collapse down into a pile of rubble in six seconds the way that Building 7 did. So it changes completely how you're going to fight high-rise fires. It's the only steel-framed building in history, high-rise building in history, that's ever collapsed from fire alone. All of the others have stayed up. Where there's been fires, you've, there's been partial collapses, there's been little bits fall off, but the entire building has never gone from 47 storeys to three storeys of rubble in a few seconds. So every procedure for fighting high-rise buildings is going to have to change. So for firefighters, everything's going to change. For building engineers and architects, it's also going to have to change because the unspoken um, acceptance before that the building frame would always stay up because the fire can't get hot enough to take out a steel frame well, clearly, according to NIST now, this can happen. So that means that you have to either beef up the fire protection, which has got to be retrofitted on every high-rise building on the planet, or you have to use new materials that can resist uh, office fires better than steel. So, and when you think about that, if the office fire is going up to 1,000 degrees centigrade and the steel is only affected at 1600 degrees centigrade, well, how much higher than 1600 do you have to go? There's, there's one particular piece on the internet called um, um, the editor's part of the conspiracy, where they go on to describe their reports of Building 7 as shrouded in uncertainty, that, that they didn't make any assertion it had definitely gone down. Well, that's a complete lie. I mean, are you watching a different report? Now, more on the latest building collapse in New York. You might have heard a few moments ago I was talking about the Salomon Brothers building collapsing, and indeed it has. Jane, what more can you tell us about the Salomon Brothers building and its collapse? Presumably there were very few people in the Salomon building when it collapsed. And most people who watch the BBC still trust them. Uh, three million people, I think, watched Conspiracy Road Trip. And in that, one, one prime example of this would be um, <laughs> the questions surrounding the the flights. Now they interview a guy called Robert Haddo. Now Robert Haddo is a light aircraft pilot and he takes up one of these young conspiracy theorists that the BBC have roped into doing this program to try and convince them of the error of their ways. Now <laughs> what happens is um, takes the girl up in the aircraft, fly around for a bit. It's a light aircraft. Look how easy it is to pilot a plane. Yes, no, no, all right. It's easier to fly a big jet. I mean, do you know much about Boeing's? As a matter of fact, yes. Okay, the, the exact Boeing that went into the, sen the World Trade Center? All they had to do was fly straight and level uh, towards, a, towards a target. I don't know why they interviewed Mr. Haddo and portrayed him or have him portray himself as some kind of expert on commercial jetliners. He's never flown a jetliner, as he said in his email. Um, and he turned around to me and said that the, the flight envelope, the, 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 the manageability of the aircraft, capabilities of the aircraft, make flying a commercial jetliner considerably harder than flying a light aircraft. So the complete antithesis of what he says in the programme. Now, the interesting thing is, what the BBC could have done, and any researcher will be able to find this interview in a minute. I flew the two actual aircraft uh, which were involved in 9-11, the flight number 175 and flight 93, the 757 that allegedly went down at Shanksville, and flight 175 is the aircraft that's uh, alleged to have hit the South Tower. I don't believe it's possible for, like I said, for a terrorist, a so-called terrorist, to train on a 172 and then jump in a cockpit of a 757, 767 glass cockpit and 
vertical navigate the aircraft, lateral navigate the aircraft, and fly the airplane at speeds exceeding its design limit speed by well over 100 knots. I couldn't do it, and I'm absolutely positive they couldn't do it. Ian Henschel's the top expert on the paper trail in the country, and he lives not far away from me on the south coast, so I, uh, I dragged Ian in to give his expertise on the paper trail, which is as frightening as Building 7. The only investigations were the investigations for evidence to fit the pre-decided official story. Before the FBI even started work on this case, they had been told what the story was very, very clearly by the US media in total uh, unison by politicians all over the world, by the UN Security Council within 24 hours. This was an Al-Qaeda terrorist hit there was nothing the American government could have done about it. They were completely taken by surprise. Any suggestion about any other possibility is an outrageous slur on the American government and the American people. That's what the FBI brief said before they started that investigation. But at the moment, things look pretty bad. The CIA have got a lot of explaining to do. And the longer they go on in denial, and that is their current position, they flat out deny Richard Clark's allegation that they must have consciously allowed the 9-11 hijackers a safe passage. Consciously allowed, um, that's a lot to answer to. And the evidence supports Richard Clark, no doubt about it. The evidence from the paper trail, the investigations, the uh, Inspector General's reports, it all points to the CIA making a conscious decision to safeguard the hijackers from arrest by the FBI. They argue that these were stray bits of information which never got collated properly. So there's been a lot of debate about that. But in recent years, the, the scales have tipped right over to the most suspicious possibilities because it's become clear that this was not lost information accidentally. This was information which was blocked. There were people in senior positions in Washington and New York who were actively obstructing FBI officers who would have arrested some, if not all, of the 9-11 hijackers had they not been obstructed. So when you come to look at the actual detailed characters of the culprits, the alleged culprits, you find some very bizarre stories. You find hard drinking guys, cocaine using guys, lap dancing enthusiasts, um, getting up one morning and all committing suicide, um, allegedly because they are, you know, devout Muslims or they believe they're gonna to go to heaven or something along those lines. We don't really know. Nobody's bothered to explain it to us in any detail. But certainly there's a lot of contradictory character issues, to say the least. Chichester police uh, came to us and said that, first of all, the British government was overseeing the investigations and would have ensured there wasn't any foul play. Well, given what we know about Tony Blair's relationship with George Bush and how the British police actually do not have jurisdiction in the United States, that's absurd. That's just indefensibly stupid to say that, to be honest. Um, secondly, they said that nobody could have kept it secret. Well, it hasn't been kept secret. Whistleblowers have come forward. They've been ignored, but they're there on record. Uh, the evidence has come out in official inquiries. We now know that the CIA were colluding for whatever reason with the alleged 9-11 hijackers. That's proven. Those weapons of mass destruction got to be somewhere.
in 1928, the world signed the Treaty for the Renunciation of War. Probably the most important law ever passed by the nations of the world, and nobody in this country seems to have heard of it. Now, it was very important because after the Second World War, Germany's leaders were prosecuted at Nuremberg and convicted of 11 breaches of the Kellogg-Briand Pact, which is the Treaty for the Renunciation of War. And that became universal law. Now, when George Bush and Tony Blair walked into Afghanistan and to Iraq, they did exactly the same as Germany's leaders did in the Second World War when they walked into Poland and Belgium and Holland and all the other European nations. And now, it's very important for ordinary soldiers to realize that the judgment at Nuremberg applies to every human being. And one of the key arguments that uh, Germany's leaders made was that they were only following orders. Now, the judges said, no, that's got good enough. If your government breaks the laws of war, you must refuse to obey their orders. And it is that law, which was introduced in 1950, which every one of Britain's armed forces has been breaking ever since. So both the police and the armed forces have a duty in law to refuse to obey the orders to fight in Afghanistan or to support the war in Syria or to attack Libya or uh, to take part in the uh, attacks on Iraq. All of those were illegal. And what very few members of the armed forces or the police know is that it is a criminal offence to follow an unlawful order. And that's what they have been doing for the last 12 years. It wasn't only people who died on 9-11. It was trust. Trust that the laws these men fought for would be cherished and preserved faith that our leaders and press would never con a new generation of soldiers into breaking those laws. And they have, and this time for a series of abject and calculated lies. We've no justification in puffing out our chests with pride every time one of those glorious aircraft take to the sky, when we've permitted all they stand for to be shot down by liars, frauds and war profiteers. If you wear a poppy next Remembrance Day, wear it having made at least some gesture of defiance against the despicable and mendacious bastards who've led this country into phony war after phony war. The United States knows that Iraq has weapons of mass destruction. The UK knows. Which could be activated within 45 minutes including against his own... Shia. Any country on the face of the earth with an active intelligence program knows that Iraq has weapons of mass destruction. And if he does not disarm, the United States of America will lead a coalition and disarm him in the name of peace. dreads to think what any Spitfire pilot would make of the country he fought for and what it now does in the name of peace. Over a million and a half people can march in protest on the streets of London, but still we are taken to war. Some democracy. We can poison babies for millennia to come with weaponry containing depleted uranium, and still the corporate media conveniently swerves the issue. How oh, stupid can this country get? How wicked. Oh, and this little oik, claiming for expenses to attend a war memorial. Lying about the effects of depleted uranium on our troops and helpless Iraqi children. We asked numerous church leaders to take part in this film. They all declined. 
A shame. We thought they liked miracles. Well, the first thing I'd say to somebody who was endeavoring to join the military, you know, hell, my kids might make that choice someday. I, I have to be willing to accept that possibility. Um, and I'd probably say the same thing to, to them that I, I would to a young man today, and that would be, I understand where your desire is to help your country and to protect against what you see as a, a threat to your way of life. But unfortunately, the truth is far from what you're being told. And unless you're willing to look a little deeper and see what's really at play here, specifically the agenda of never-ending war, always propping up a straw man, a boogeyman, to justify never-ending policies of war, if you're not able to see that, if you're not quite able to grasp that concept, then really there's not much I can say to you. You're going to want to join and fight the good fight and so on and so forth. I understand that. You know, I'm that person. I've been there. So, and I'm not saying I'm better than you, smarter than you, or anything like that. However, if anyone takes an honest look at 9-11, and specifically Building 7, they will realize they're being lied to. And the entire system is set up to continue lying to them. That tells you a lot about not only how much our government feels about us, but also about what our government's real agenda is and what they're really endorsing, which is a never-ending state of war. These people are psychopaths. They don't have compassion and empathy like a healthy human being does. They don't care about you or me. They don't care about the military. They call us heroes to their media and whatnot. They don't give a shit about us at all. And they certainly don't give a shit about the Iraqi people or the Iranian people or, or any people for that matter. So if you want to understand the way the world functions, you need to look at it from the perspective of a psychopath who is drunk on his own power. Now, if you can get into that place and start to look at the way the world functions, you're going to find that it all makes perfect sense. Keep in mind these people also have spent their trillions and trillions of dollars and pounds on building things such as underground compounds, which I don't know if you've got an invitation, but I don't. And these people are so nuts that they are willing, in my opinion, to set off a third world war, look at the policies with regards to antagonizing Russia. What the hell are we doing? We're picking a fight with a nation. Is Russia seriously a threat to Europe or the West? That's just ridiculous. Of course they're not. Why would you do such a thing? Would a sane, healthy human being carry out a policy like that? No. No. But if you're a psychopath who sees that the only way that you can maintain your position of power is to divide people, then you see war as a good thing. For you, war is great. So everything you can do to get people to fight a war against each other and keep fighting each other is good for you. Now, if you're sane, that doesn't make sense. So you need to get out of your sane perspective, get into the mind of a psychopath, drunk on his own power, and see the world that way, and all of these things will make perfect sense. So, In the case of ISIS, our best friends and allies in Saudi Arabia, uh, they are the funders of ISIS, as are Qatar, another friend of ours. If you're not willing to accept that our good friends and allies, the ones that we're doing big military uh, defense contracts with, the United States just did a $60 billion contract with Saudi Arabia, which is now pummeling the poorest nation in the Middle East, Yemen. Um, unless you're willing to accept the fact that our best friends and allies, political allies, are actually the funders of ISIS, and that our governments, they're providing political cover to Saudi Arabia and Qatar and these other nations, the bottom line is you need to look deeper. Because if you're willing to put yourself in a position to kill or be killed, you should make damn sure that it's worth it, really. Because there's 22 American service members a day, and who knows how many English uh, service members a day who are committing suicide every day. And I tell you, the reason why they're doing that is because they realize deep down that whatever lies they've been told don't square with the truth. And they have gone into someone else's land and killed people, including women and children, and they're suffering so badly from that that the best exit for them is to commit suicide. If you have a fighting spirit, if you're a warrior and you want to do a, if you want to fight, then fight the right cause, fight the just cause, fight a cause that will serve all humanity, not some bogus agenda manipulated by the powers that be to get you to go fight wars for a bunch of chicken hawk cowards who will never go off and do the killing that they're ordering you to commit, and they certainly won't have their children going there anyway. They're a bunch of cowards. I don't know why you'd give your life for these cowards.
I came home late one night after a, a, a week out of town working, and my son and his mother came in and, and, ex, and told me that uh, Noah had shot himself. And actually, that was the first night I had slept in like three months. I know it sounds horrible, but it was just simply, that's the way it is. I knew it was coming, and you were waiting. But what really worried me was his anger toward all of us for letting it happen. He was well armed. He had a 38. He had a, 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 a rifle from his, his grandfather that served in World War II. And I was worried about him retaliating against us. And even his mother admitted that uh, he did us a favor because of what could have probably happened. The streets were vacant. There was really no resistance. They just showed up, started cleaning up the mess. The sewer plants were bombed. The water plants were bombed. Just, just this precision bombing just didn't work. Um, these little kids were really disturbing. They uh, came out after three days. They were in shock and they were starving. And he said they, for another couple of days, they would just watch them from the background. And eventually they, took, they, they, they realized they weren't going to be fired upon, and they just all of a sudden went off and started feeding on these little tadpoles that were in the ditches there. And our soldiers couldn't feed them. They couldn't do any, any help at all. And so these kids started throwing rocks. And they pelted our soldiers for day after day, and then the orders finally came through to shoot these kids so they could get the bodies cleaned up. He didn't engage in it, but others did. And they were so frustrated. You know, here they were just, you know, six months before they were at Ronald McDonald land. And now they're in a, a, a war zone. War crimes are being committed on a massive scale. And after these, some of these soldiers killed these kids, that's my son said that's when the suicide started. And I really don't want to say it in public, but I really think that these 22 a day that are committing suicide should go into city council and inform them that uh, you're, my life is fucked. And one of these days I'm going to shoot myself in your park and you'll have to clean up my corpse. I mean, I know it sounds cold and cruel, but, uh, you know, I would rather have my son do that than just go out in the woods and do it peacefully. I, you know, taking your own life is the way you want to do it. But if I was, I would show up right in city council and, and have my corpse hauled out of there. You know, I mean, they, like I said, these were the adults that sent kids in the war. I tried to tell them just to bail. Just, just do not do it. You're better off to do jail time than uh, what you're about to go through. Even I didn't know how cruel these people could be. You know, the, 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 the training they give these kids is almost guaranteed a suicide. In um, the Civil War and World War II particularly, they discovered that uh, only 15% of soldiers were actually engaging in, in pulling the trigger. And so they needed to change that. And they developed these uh, video games. And they're very effective on desensitizing you. So what is happening now, these, uh, these kids have got up to it, I guess it's a 98% kill rate, but they can't turn it off. They set up these road checkpoints, and they were very, very confusing. And basically, they had brainwashed our soldiers into seeking revenge on the Iraqis for September 11th. They, they were a whipping boy. And apparently, the doctor got a call, his family had been bombed, and he was coming up through a checkpoint, was frustrated, um, looked different, and the order just came down for my son to shoot the guy and shot him, got him through the neck. But until you educate the population, it'll just never change. You know, um, these people do what they do. They create war to create their profits, and we, wholeheartedly join the military, we pay our taxes, we, we follow unconditionally without asking any critical questions. They, they call you a conspiracy theorist and instead of talking about the technical, they want to know the who, the whys, and the whats. In other words, they want to engage in the conspiracy theory. World Trade Center 7, I have no idea how they could do something like that, but it's obvious through the evidence we have that it was brought down in controlled demolitions. So that is a job for policemen 
and investigators, that's their job, and they are failing at this point to uh, accomplish that. denies talking to you on that day of 9-11. Can you answer those questions and address the theories against you? The leaseholder of the World Trade Center complex, Larry Silverstein, gave a uh, public interview on PBS in 2002, and he said that they pulled that building, which is a demolition term for intentionally breaking down a building. This man made over $5 billion from those buildings' destruction, and I want to know if there was ever a formal investigation into Larry Silverstein, the leaseholder, of the World Trade Center complex and his ties to this entire event. I don't believe there's been a formal investigation. I haven't heard that. I don't know that. I do know that uh, they, that, that wall, I remember, was, was in danger, and I think that they made a decision based on the danger that it had of destroying other things, that they did it in a controlled fashion. 